The Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Hey, Garrett Oosterhouse here with realagriculture.com. We are back here with another Canola School episode today. And I have here with me Vincent Irve, who is a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada based in Winnipeg, Manitoba. How is it going today? Going very well. Thank you. So we're here today to talk about cutworms and uh, some of the things that producers should be looking out for. You've done some recent cutworm research as well. Can you tell me a bit about what you were looking at? So I was looking at biocontrol options for cutworms, and uh, particularly a species of parasitoid, which is a species related to wasps that lays eggs inside of cutworms. The eggs hatch, and the little larvae feed on the internal uh, organs of the cutworms and eventually killing it. So we're looking at a particular species, Cotigia vanese, uh, that was found in uh, a part of Ontario, and that we are looking if it could be uh, relocated across Canada. Uh, but this research um, is still ongoing, okay. basically. Well, it's paused right now, but uh, yeah. So um, it's time now that producers are getting out and they're scouting and they're looking in their fields for cutworms. Um, so can you talk a bit about when cutworms occur and when, what sort of conditions producers will see it in? So um, previous years, uh, cutworms typically uh, do uh, injury to plants between the last week of May and the last week of June. So uh, it's likely that this will happen again this year. And it's as soon as the seedlings uh, start to grow that uh, somebody should start monitoring because that's when the first and most uh, problem um, occur. And what sort of conditions do they like? So they like it dry, typically. Okay, so they overwinter starting in the fall then? Uh, so the eggs are laid um, in the field the year before, and so they overwinter either as larvae or as uh, eggs. And so the species that overwinter as eggs will hatch in the spring and start to feed then. And the species that overwinter as larvae start to feed in the, um, in the fall and resume their feeding as the temperatures warm up in the spring. So if producers are out looking for cutworms, what does the damage actually look like? What are those first signs? So it can look like a few different things. So one thing is the they will cut the plants, especially the young seedlings. And so that's why they are called cutworms. So if you see a dead plant, uh, it may be cut. So you pull on it and uh, it comes or then you know it's cut. So there are other pests that can do this damage, but uh, cutworms do that. And uh, when the leaves start to develop, then they will uh, feed on the leaves, making large nudges on the leaves. So that's another sign of cutworms. And what can producers do for monitoring? Like, do they come out at certain times of the day or night or that sort of thing? Uh, they can come any time of the day uh, for monitoring. It's easier when there is light out, although the cutworms are hiding. So they should monitor as soon as the seeds start to germinate. Uh, if, they are, if the seeds are not coming, as they should be, they can check if they've been cut. And uh, they can check for the presence of gaps within rows. So what cutworms do is they will feed on a plant and then they will usually move to the nearest plant. So then they can damage uh, plants in a row. So that's typical of cutworms usually. So check for missing dead or dying plants, right? And um, check for bare patches also. So that's another telltale signs of cutworms. If there is a bare patch in the field and uh, Usually these bare patches happen on the hilltops, uh, especially if it's sandy or south facing slopes, because they prefer those conditions. That's usually where the, lay, the eggs are laid. So if you see uh, these signs, uh, what you can do is check for the presence of cutworms to make sure uh, that really are cutworms in the field uh, making this damage. So to do so, examine the top two or three inches of soil in a one foot by one foot square. So that's about a, a tenth of a square meter. And check about 10 sites along the edges of an affected area. So 10 sites to have a representative uh, sampling. And along the edges of uh, affected area, so like a, a bare patch, because the cutworms, that's most likely where they are. So they, they are moving from the initial bare area 
to the green plants. So they are feeding on the green plants, right? And then so once you have sampled at least 10 areas, uh, take an average and uh, multiply the average band by 10 to have uh, to calculate a number of larvae per square meter. So then that could give you an indication for an economic threshold. So the most common species uh, affecting canola are the red back cutworm, the pale western cutworm, and the, the dingy cutworm, and sometimes the dark sided cutworm as well. So the red back is definitely the, the most important species on the prairie. So for red back, the economic threshold is four to five larvae per square meter. It's the same for pale western. Uh, dark sided is five to six larvae per square meter. So the larvae tend to be a little bit smaller, so that's why. And uh, the dingy cutworm is actually a stand reduction of 25 to 30 percent. That is the economic threshold. Uh, one thing to know is the pale western is a subterranean species, which means it remains underground. While the three other species that I mentioned, uh, they come out uh, usually at dusk to feed on the plants above ground. Uh, another thing to know is um, spray is more effective at, at dusk because that's when the species that are not subterranean will come out and feed. So they will be in direct contact with the insecticide if sprayed. Uh, the species that feed underground can be very difficult to control. Uh, it might not always work. If you see in the previous year, if you see cutworms, is there a good chance, like if you have a field that had heavy cutworm worm feeding the year before, is there a good chance you're going to see them again the next year? It depends when this uh, occurred. If it occurred in early spring, uh, it doesn't mean anything because the cutworms turn into moth and they fly and then they come back at the end of the summer and they, it could be anywhere. Uh, if you see young cutworm in the fall, so that's a different story. So these uh, are probably cutworms that are going to overwinter where they are and resume feeding in the spring. So yeah, if you see young cutworm in a field in the fall, uh, then you should be careful. So you have to understand that the eggs are laid uh, at the end of the summer or early fall. And so uh, the cutworms are here this whole time. And so what the female moths are looking for for laying their eggs are usually uncultivated fields with volunteers or weeds uh, for the young larvae to, to feed when they hatch. And so uh, these tend to attract uh, female, gravid females for them to lay their eggs. So it is recommended to keep uncultivated fields weed free, uh, at least from July, from late July to the end of September, to uh, prevent cutworms from laying their eggs there in massive number. So the real problem is the outbreak, right? When you have a massive number of cutworms in a specific area. And uh, sandy uh, or uh, fields that have loose soil also tend to attract more cutworms, uh, females, uh, for, for them to lay their eggs. So it's good to know. Uh, another thing is uh, before seeding in the spring, it's good to check uh, the volunteers in the field and see if these have been attacked by cutworms. Because when you seed, uh, you, you won't kill uh, the majority of these cutworms. And so then they will uh, continue feeding on the young seedlings developing. So if these volunteers are, or weeds are attacked by cutworms in the spring, it is recommended to wait uh, to uh, to till the field and then wait for 10 days for them to starve before seeding. And that will reduce um, the risk of having to uh, deal with the problem of cutworms later on. Another telltale sign of cutworms when you are seeding is uh, uh, birds following the tractors. And usually these are seagulls or grackles and these like to feed on cutworms. So if you see this, it's good to stop and see uh, what they are feeding on. And if you see cutworms, then you know that uh, you're probably uh, dealing with a uh, cutworm problem in this field. Okay, awesome. And in the fall time, when you're looking for these uh, cutworm eggs, um, can they be seen with a visible eye? Or are they something that can be scouted for? It's extremely difficult to do. Uh, certain cutworm species will lay their eggs at the base of the plant, uh, just at just below ground level, a few millimeters below ground level. But most cutworm species don't. They will lay their eggs right into the soil, in loose soil. So it's impossible, well, virtually impossible to find the eggs. So unfortunately, we rely on finding larvae or uh, the damage they cause. Okay, awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to add? 
Yeah, uh, it's good to keep in mind a number of factors that may affect uh, cutworm problems or, or not, actually. Uh, for example, a long rain that keeps the soil saturated with water for a few days will uh, keep the cutworms out of the ground for a few days, and that will expose them to natural enemies. And these are ground beetles, which will feed on these cutworms, as well as parasitoids, uh, so the little wasp, right, that lay their eggs inside the cutworms and kill them. And in the past, some, um, there are some reports that uh, these have actually uh, stopped uh, emerging outbreaks. So if you see cutworm problems and then there is a long rain, it's good to check again after that, to see if there is still a cutworm problem after that or not. Another thing is uh, cutworms, when they are about an inch long or so, they are about uh, ready to pupate. So they are about ready, uh, uh, it's about time for them to stop feeding. So if you see large cutworms like this, uh, control may not be required because they are going to stop uh, feeding anyway.